Well, the evolution of journalism has faced many obstacles, including a current epidemic in its way. That, of course, is misinformation. Legendary journalist Carl Bernstein has seen it all, from a copy boy to winning the Pulitzer Prize for breaking the Watergate scandal. He visits that journey in his new book out today titled Chasing History, A Kid in the Newsroom. Here he is with Walter Isaacson discussing his memoir and the issues that intersect politics and our culture today. Carl Bernstein, man, welcome to the show. It's good to be with you, old friend. <laughs> Tell me about that moment when you first walked into the Washington Star newsroom and you got addicted to the clatter and clang of a newsroom. Well, I, I had applied for a job as a copy boy and I hadn't been hired yet. But the man who eventually hired me took me through a door into the newsroom, which I hadn't seen yet. And there was it's this incredible chaos and commotion, but yet it was an ordered commotion. And, and everybody was running around and yelling copy, and they were deadline. And it was the most exciting thing I think I've ever seen in my life. What were you wearing? I was wearing a cream-colored suit that I bought a few days earlier in downtown Washington at No Label Louis. Uh, <laughs> there's a tale in the book, early in the book, uh, about that suit, about that suit. Uh, and the kind of hazing ritual that I was put through with suit. Tell me about that hazing ritual. You had to wash the carbon paper, man. How'd you fall? How'd you fall for that one? I uh, I had a feeling that, that, my, that my leg was being pulled to use a, a polite expression. Uh, but the assistant head copy boy told me and showed me how part of the copy boy's job was to go around the newsroom and to pick up all the sheets of this terrible double-sided carbon paper. If you just put your fingers on it, it went up like dust. Uh, and that was part of the copy boy's job. And we did it, we did it every day. But he said, oh, Bernstein, he looked up at the clock and he said, it's noon. And I said, yeah, it's noon. And he says, time to wash the carbon paper. And I thought about that and said, wash the carbon paper? And uh, especially because my father at the time owned the laundromat. And, you know, I'm somewhat familiar with washing machines, but, but wash the carbon paper? And he said, yeah, you better hurry up or we're going to be in trouble. And, and he had me go around in the whole newsroom and pick up every sheet, you know, like 100, 200 sheets of this double-sided carbon paper and put it in a basket. And I was holding it out in front of me like that so it wouldn't get on my cream-colored suit. And, and, and he said, now take that in the men's room and go watch that. So I went into the men's room and put it in the sink and it filled the sink to about like that. And I turned on the water. It was one of those newfangled faucets with, with a big spray and it sprayed up and suddenly my new cream colored suit, I looked like a, like a damn leopard with, uh, that, that had been in a rainstorm. And uh, with all these spots, it was all empurpled uh, from the carbon paper. And, uh, and, and I knew that, you know, wait a minute, something's not right here. So, but to get more serious for a second, what were the values you learned in the old-fashioned newsroom that's almost like out of the movies? Well, this, this is one of the, it's an old-fashioned newsroom, almost in, in the honey, get me rewrite mold, but it's also, and, and if the book, I think, resonates to today and today's media, because it is about what Woodward and I came to call the best obtainable version of the truth. And the star had an epic about the truth and how you get to that contextual truth by knocking on doors, by making sure your sources don't have an ax to grind. It was a much more fair and balanced newspaper than the Washington Post was at that time before Ben Bradley got to the Post and threw out the old ways of the, of the Washington Post, which bled its opinions onto the newspaper pages. But Washington Star never did that. And you know, Woodward and I would talk about the best obtainable version of the truth. And it, was almost exactly the phrase that was used by my mentors at the Star. And, and they were absolutely insistent, you know, the elements of what is the, the truth? Uh, well, it's about context as, as well as just stringing together disparate facts. And it's about going out and, and seeing one source after another, after another, after another. And, and, and one of the things this book is about, yes, it's about another time in America, another time in journalism, but it is also about how we still need to get stories by this methodology that, you know, that we used in Watergate, but it started at the star. That's, that's where I learned it. 
Now, tell me about that phrase, the best obtainable version of the truth, because somebody will say, okay, there is no absolute truth. But the cool it's thing not. about that phrase is you say, yeah, but we're aiming there. You're aiming there, but you keep going. You don't stop. You may get the story one day. Look, let's look at Watergate. We did 200 stories uh, in a year on Watergate. That's what we would have done in, at the star. You do the story, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. Uh, you don't take no, you use common sense. You don't go visit people in their offices when their boss is next to them. You go to their houses at night, uh, like Woodward and I did. I learned all that stuff at, at the star. At the star, it came naturally to people. You said that at the Washington Star, they were careful not to blur opinions with news and journalism. Absolutely. There is a line that was in, that you did not cross that line. So how did we end up crossing that line where we blur opinion with news journalism? I think it's uh, both the country and journalistic institutions at once. I think we need to look at the country as a culture not just as a politics and a media enterprise. And, and people began looking, say 15, 20, 25 years ago for information and news, quote in quotes, that fit their own preconceived notions of what the truth ought to be to reinforce what they already believe. And increasingly, I think media institutions started to feed that out of control beast. Uh, particularly the Murdoch newspapers, for instance. You look at what the New York Post became. Uh, it, it, it not only bled opinion, uh, it was not interested in what this complicated truth is. The truth can be very complicated. And I think one of the things that we were able to do uh, in the 1960s, 70s, and into the 80s uh, in journalism was to reflect the complexity of, of the truth. Look, great reporting has always been the exception, but good reporting had really been uh, a hallmark of an awful lot of, of newsrooms in this country. And that started to change. Also, a kind of, you know, again, getting back to what I learned at the star. Laziness is maybe the greatest sin. You've got to keep going. You can't stop. And the minute you, you do that, you undercut the best obtainable version of the truth because you, you've got to keep getting more facts, more information, more misinformation that you say, wait a minute, I've gone to another source and that source says that's misinformation and disinformation. So it's not just that you're getting from your sources the truth, often you're getting what's not the truth. Then you have to make those decisions about what is the truth. And that was just bred into us at the start. My first day at the job at the Times Pick Union in New Orleans, I had to go door knocking. I said, go knock on that door, find out what happened during the situation. Uh, likewise, when we covered politics in New Hampshire, I remember you'd go door knocking. In your book, you talk about knocking on people's doors. Explain why that's so important. Um, because you get people at home, when they're relaxed, when they're with their cup of coffee, when they're, you know, the kids are, are, are around. They're in an environment in which they're free of pressure. Uh, and, you know, maybe the best scene in some ways in All the President's Men, it's a, you know, the movie has some great scenes in it. And uh, uh, they probably did a better job uh, of, of showing some of the aspects of reporting than we did in the book, quite honestly. And there's that scene where I, or Dustin Hoffman playing me, goes to see the bookkeeper and, and who knows the secrets of how money was used to pay for this, this espionage and sabotage that was the real meaning of, of Watergate from the White House. And, and I get my foot in the door, and, but it's, it's her home and, and her sister is there. And, and I'm fighting to stay in that living room with her. And, and I'm trying to make her comfortable. You're going to people with an expectation that very often they're going to tell you their truth. If you give them a chance and you're a good listener, 
And reporters so often just come in with a bunch of questions, throw a microphone in a person's face if it's, if it's tele television, and run out the door when, they, when they've got a quick answer. Again, there's, a, there's a scene in the book where I go out with a great police reporter named Walter Gold. And what I learned from Walter Gold was how he got along with cops and respected them and gave them a chance to tell the truth. He brought them donuts, coffee at night at the scene of a murder. He did not treat them like, quote, in, you know, sources to be not human beings. He looked at them as people. That's the other thing that we learned at the Star. We're dealing with people with emotions, particularly because we were covering, covering civil rights, people who were being denied their rights, who bled, who hurt. And that's the other thing about even in Watergate, the sources had feelings. And if we could start to comprehend their feelings, look at Deep Throat even. He was outraged at what he had seen. It was getting to that human factor in part that enabled the reporting, knowing that the bookkeeper was exercised. Somebody had said to me, you go see that bookkeeper because she knows and she's angry. She doesn't like what she had to do. That's part of the story. You're not going to get that on Google. As you were going through the Trump scandals, it obviously brought back a lot of memories of what you and Bob Woodward did in Watergate. How were things different uh, in the Trump scandals, especially the journalism? And was that a problem? It was a problem, but I think it's a, it was a problem that, that a lot of the press met brilliantly. It might have taken a little while, but they started reporting on television in newspapers, newspapers, yeah, newspapers, but also online, the best obtainable version of truth about Trump. And I can remember, you might remember this, for, you know, I'm at CNN. And in the early months of the, of the Trump presidency, I went on the air and, and I said, he is lying. He is a serial liar. And I think it may have been the first time that anybody said this. And, and I remember thinking long and hard that I was going to do this on the air. He is a serial liar. And I said, you know, I have to step back myself as a reporter. It almost takes my breath away to hear myself saying that on the air. But it's repertorially accurate. It's justified by the facts. And so we now need to be reporting on his serial lying because it's the fact, it's the context, it's the best obtainable version of the truth. And if we ignore that lie, that serial lie, then we are not telling the truth in our reporting. So I think what happened, that, that Trump was so extreme in, in his actions, in his authoritarianism, in his disdain for truth, so extreme, so easy in some ways to get as a reporter facts, accounts of his dishonesty, accounts of his authoritarianism, uh, accounts of his disbelief in democracy, that, that the reporting was done. What wasn't, what didn't happen is people in the country were indifferent to a large extent. A huge number of people in our country are more than indifferent to what Trump did and has done. Damn near half the country is, is saying in one way or another, given what his vote was and, and the support he continues to have, uh, okay, it's all right that he does these things. One reason that people felt that way about Trump and supported him and said, yes, yeah, stick it to him, is because they hated the media. W what was that about? Oh, I, you know, I, they hated the media. I think it's easy to, uh, to go, you know, during Watergate, in the early phases, you know, uh, Richard Nixon tried to make the conduct of the press the issue in Watergate, the conduct specifically of Woodward and me and Ben Bradley at the Washington Post. And every day, a spokesman for the president would get up and attack us for using innuendo and hearsay and all this. And it, it worked. 
for a good while. That tendency of people to blame the messenger is always going to be there. We now live in a different culture in which truth is devalued by huge numbers of people uh, who are looking for reinforcement of what they already believe in, in, in their media consumption. That's a big difference uh, from when you and I started out in, in, in this business. We live in a different culture. We live in a culture of untruth to a large extent. What caused that? What, what, why did that happen? Uh, it's way beyond anything. Uh, the locus of it is not journalism. The locus of it is cultural. It has to do with the forces that have been building in this country for 30, 35 years. You probably heard me say on the air over and over again, we're in a cold civil war in this country. I said it, you know, ad infinitum to the point where I think people got sick of it. But then that cold civil war was ignited by Trump. And we are now past the point of ignition. And, and that is also what we need to be reporting on right now. Let's also turn for a minute to, to what may be the biggest story of all. And that, that I think that every news organization has got to keep on through uh, this presidency, the next presidency, and that is voter suppression. Voter suppression. We have one of our two political parties is now committed to undermining democratic election. That's really what the Trump lies are about, and they're embraced by the Republican Party. It's astonishing. It's amazing what happened January 6th in the White House. It is amazing what those Republican senators and congressmen have done since to embrace the untruth of what happened on January 6th and who was responsible. So this gives a totally different reporting imperative, I think, than, we, than we've ever had before. Because never, you have to go back to the Civil War when, when one of the two parties has become wed to undemocracy. That's factual. That's the best obtainable version of the truth. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody in, in, in that party or everybody who votes for that party is, is, is committed to undemocracy. But right now, that story, it's not a story just about politics. It's a story about our culture. That's what we need to be reporting on right now. Carl Barnstein, thank you so much for joining us. Good to us. be with you, old friend.